So take it away, Adam. Thank you, Wendy. I'd like to thank everyone for listening today. Um, my name is Adam Ringler. I'm a scientist with the USGS and I'm located at the Albuquerque Seismological Lab, although today I'm located at my house. So um, a brief overview of what I'd like to talk about today is so first I'm going to quickly discuss some of the history of seismic instrumentation and then I'm going to discuss current instrumentation, um, what we can and can't observe, some basic seismic data processing, so I'll go over some quick QC examples, and then examples of where things can go wrong. So very briefly, we can say that observational seismology started around 132 AD with Zhang Heng's seismoscope. So over on the left, I have an example of the seismoscope. So it had these dragons and then a ball would um, drop out of the dragon's mouth into the frog's mouth and that would indicate an earthquake came from um, a particular direction. So if we we can sort of say that there's roughly eight bits, of, eight different states depending on which frog uh, the dragon's, um, the ball of the dragon's mouth dropped into, um, there's about eight different states or we could say that that's uh, two to the three bits or we so we can encode about three bits of information from this seismometer. So we'll use this quantity to compare to newer instrumentation as we move through. So moving on to more early seismographs on the right side, I'm showing a picture of Arthur J. Weed um, on his Weed seismograph from the University of Virginia. This was around 1928. Um, so this would have been a torsional instrument. Um, so looking at sort of early seismographs, there was a lot of different instruments that looked like this and they were all very unique um, with little standardization, um, but they're actually quite impressive instruments if you go back and look at some of the different ways people were trying to record ground motion. So if we go over to and take a small detour on dynamic range, um, we should briefly recall how a seismometer works. So remember we're we're on the ground but we want to record how the ground is moving so we need some sort of inertial reference frame so the idea is that we have a suspended mass right here and that this mass doesn't move but the frame of the frame relative to the mass does move so we might have a little pointer and we'd have a ruler and then as the ground moves up and down um, we watch sort of our squiggles move on the ruler so we're watching the displacement of the mass relative to the frame um, and that's how we're recording our signal. So based on this principle, it's useful to come up with sort of a first piece of jargon that I'll, I'll use throughout the talk, which is dynamic range. So the dynamic range of something is, it's the ratio of the smallest signal, so maybe the etchings of the ruler that we could resolve to the largest signal. So it would be the peak to peak motion of this frame relative to the mass, and that would be called the dynamic range of it. And so if we go back to hang seismometer, we said there was two to the three options, or we had roughly um, eight dragons, so we called it a three-bit system. And so we can encode this information in some units that are a little easier to work with. Um, and so if we briefly recall that um, we can look at a signal in terms of amplitude or power, and power being the amplitude squared, we can come up with some units called decibels, which are um, which are shown here as we take our power of our signal, we take the log 10 of it, multiply it by 10, and that's the dB. Or if we have an amplitude, we take the amplitude and we put 20 log 10 of it. So that when we speak of dB, it doesn't matter if we're speaking in terms of power or amplitude because the units are the same. And so for an example of hang seismometer, we have an 18 dB dynamic system because we have about eight options in amplitude. And so we put it into our little formula and we have an 18 dB dynamic range system. So um, moving forward, we can kind of look at sort of the first standardized seismograph network. So this is the worldwide standardized seismographic network. Um, it started being deployed in 1961. There were about a hundred stations globally. Um, and one of the, um, Big things about this network is it was standardized so that all the systems would record similarly and were calibrated similarly. So 
on the right side, I have an example of the station. So these are the three long period components over here. These are the three short period components over here. We have a timing console in the middle, and then we have Galvos. So these are basically um, light um, measuring devices that would go onto photo paper on these drum rolls. So this system had about 40 dB of dynamic range uh, compared to um, the previous uh, or early seismoscope, which had about 18 dB of dynamic range. Okay, so now sort of come we come to the sort of first state of modern seismology. So roughly what we've been looking at for the last 40 years, and that's the STS-1. So on the left, I have a picture of an STS-1. Um, it's inside of a bell jar where a vacuum is pulled. There's a new metal shield around it. And then over here is the actual seismometer. And then it works based on the same principle. We have a seismic mass over here. We have a frame and we wanna measure the displacement of the frame relative to the mass during ground motion. Um, and so this has been sort of the workhorse of observational seismology for the last 40 years. Um, and one network where these have been very widely deployed is the Global Seismographic Network. So it's about 150 stations um, with telemetry across the world. So here's all the little all the little stars to note the stations. And then at each station, we usually have a very broadband sensor. So something like the STS-1 I just showed, a secondary sensor. We have um, a digitizer, communication infrastructure, and then a whole bunch of additional uh, packages for recording things like um, weather and infrasound and geomag. So we can argue that these new sensors are roughly 140 dB of dynamic range. Um, so we've gone from 18 from the first seismometer to 140 dB of dynamic range in a modern instrument. So now that I've given a quick overview of the history, I'd sort of like to spend a bit of time talking about what this current instrumentation can do. Um, so maybe to step back, we first want to say, okay, what is it that we actually want to record? Well, we wanna record some really, really small signals. So we might say a signal that we haven't yet recorded is the Schlichter mode, which is the um, oscillation of the solid inner core relative to its mean. And if we consider moderately large earthquakes, this should have an uh, amplitude of around minus 220 dB. So this would be a very, very small signal. Um, we also want to record as seismologists, very large signals. So some people might be interested in uh, near field strong ground motions, which could be up to 2G. Um, and then we also want to record signals that that occur over very long time periods. So for example, diurnal earth tides. So this is how the earth deforming from um, the moon, which occurs at a period of a day. Um, and then we also want to record high frequency signals. So these could be things up, upwards of 50 Hertz. So we want to record very slow signals, uh, fast signals and then small and big signals. And so um, there's a way to actually describe what this all is and we call these operating range diagrams. So this is a good way of showing all the information that we wanna record. So what I have is on the horizontal axis is frequency content of the signal. So what is the dominant frequency we're looking at? And then the amplitude of the signal is shown on the vertical. So if we we're interested in earth tides, they would show somewhere over here in this gray region at a period of around a day. Um, people interested in normal modes would be looking in this region around a millihertz or a sub millihertz. And then um, we also have ocean generated microseisms, which occur um, right around um, 0.1 hertz, which is this brown region. And then we also can look at sort of near field high frequency events, which I've uh, plotted two of them, two of them here from a site. So the orange is from an aftershock, which we're gonna look at a little more. Um, and the blue is the same thing, but it's recorded on a different instrument, but they're next to each other. Um, and then we also have the peak motions that we can record. So remember 
the dynamic range is the smallest motion we can record relative to the um, largest. And so I've drawn on here the clip levels of two different instruments. So this is uh, the pink one is the clip level of a trillion compact. And this yellow is the clip level of um, a strong motion accelerometer. So, okay, so we've been using these um, numbers dB. And so to get a sense of what, um, what the scale of 140 dB of dynamic range means, so um, we can roughly say that if our the big, biggest signal we can record is this pink line, and then if we say down here somewhere is the smallest signal we could record, we would have about 140 dB. And 140 dB ends up being the equivalent of having a ruler starting from uh, southwest United States up to the northeast, um, and that ruler would have markings every nine inches. So that gives you an idea of just how much range between smallest signal to largest signal is in about 140 dB of dynamic range. So this is this is a very impressive sort of scale you can see. Similarly, going along the horizontal axis, remember we're sort of interested in things from earth type uh, frequencies all the way up to near field ground motions. So that's seven decades of frequencies. Um, and so for reference, human ears can hear about three and a half decades. So again, we we're looking at sort of very slow signals to very high frequency signals. And we're also looking at very small signals to very large signals. So briefly uh, on those plots, we have these two black lines, which I want to describe. Um, and so first you're gonna ask, well, why did these two black lines just flip? So one thing that can be a little confusing in seismology is that we often um, switch between period and frequency. So you just want to remember that uh, period is one over frequency or frequency is one over period. And so whatever the units are most convenient to speak in, generally this gets flipped. So for example, here we're now in period, whereas we've just flipped the scales. So going back to these two black lines, these are called the Peterson new low noise model, which is this black line. And the upper one is the Peterson high noise model. And so what these are is this is a model of background earth noise in the absence of earthquakes. Um, so this is our micro seism band where the oceans generate um, signal and then we have the primary and so forth. But this is a, a it's a good model to to check data because if you don't have an earthquake in your data, it should lie between these two lines if you're doing everything correctly or if the instrument doesn't have a problem. Um, so this is just a, sort of a, a way of verifying, is, is my data in fact what I think it is? Is Does it lie between these two curves? So going back to our example of our two spectra from the aftershock, well, we have an earthquake in there, so no, it doesn't lie between these two lines. And so that's good because it means we do actually have signal in there. And so we'll show this signal a little later, but again, the orange, curve is from this little EPA sensor. So this is a strong motion sensor. Um, it has a higher clip level. And then the blue curve is from this Trillium Compact. Um, and it has a lower clip level, but it also has a lower noise level. So um, again, this is sort of what we might expect from a small regional event. And it's recorded on two different sensors uh, that are next to each other. Okay. so. I've sort of briefly gone over some of the current instrumentation and I wanna emphasize modern instrumentation is extremely good. We just saw that these instruments are capable of recording things um, on, from very small signals to very large over huge frequency bands. However, they've gotten so good that they've actually become sensitive to a whole bunch of things we don't want. So they're sensitive to pressure, magnetic field variations, temperature, wind, as well as a whole bunch of other things. And some of these things we can argue are or aren't seismically induced. But the key thing is, is for global uh, seismology, we generally don't want these sorts of signals in our data. However, before I show you some of the things we don't want, I do want to point out that we can still record some very interesting signals on these instruments, even though they're sensitive to so many things. So what I'm showing here 
is normal mode spectra from a magnitude 8.2 event. So these little peaks are the oscillations of the Earth um, after an event. And then what you can see is some of them are starting to split. And so this is where the amplitude starts to change because of the heterogeneities of the Earth. So we have the vertical uh, and two horizontals from ANMO for the 2018 magnitude 8.2 event. So this is, it's pretty incredible that these instruments are able to record things like this at such um, low frequencies. However, this isn't always the case. So I want to sort of go through and explain a couple of ex examples of where things sort of um, aren't as they seem or maybe are things we wouldn't like to record. So the first thing I want to point out is that horizontal seismic data is incredibly noisy. Um, if we look at these top plots, um, this is from a recent uh, experiment in Alaska. You can see the dashed lines show horizontal noise levels, and then the solid lines are verticals, and you can see there's about 40 dB of separation. So these sensors were all installed in shallow um, locations, and they're actually sensitive to tilt, which is causing this separation. So if we can get away from this tilt by installing a sensor, say, maybe 188 meters under the ground, we can largely eliminate that and start getting horizontal data that becomes somewhat similar to the vertical data. However, installing instruments 188 meters below the ground is not the easiest thing to do. So we're currently largely limited with horizontal data that's quite a bit more noisy. So continuing on with this example is, uh, this was a study where a number of instruments were installed at various depths. So yellow is generally shallower depths going down to um, darker colors or deeper. And you can see there's a general trend of as we go further and further underground, we get um, lower and lower horizontal noise levels. However, even at 145 meters depth, we're still having noise levels that are well above the very best horizontal noise in the GSN. Um, and so th this is an example of where we're, we're really limited because of horizontal noise um, in, in a, a fair bit of our seismic data. So I've discussed how when we go down, we get, we get better data, but I haven't explained why this is happening. And so what's going on is that horizontal sensors are sensitive to horizontal motion, so back and forth, which is what we want to record. However, they're also sensitive to tilt. So when the sensor tilts, the math sees an offset relative to the frame, and we get a signal out on the horizontals, and this introduces unwanted noise. So then if you think about it, we have all this pressure and wind at the surface, and that makes the ground deform, and that pressure and wind turns into horizontal tilt noise on the sensor, and this is why horizontals are so much more noisy than vertical component sensors. Okay, so I've now gone over some of the current instrumentation and some of what we can and can't observe. And I've also uh, gone over a brief history of seismic instrumentation. So now I wanna go through some basic seismic data processing or some quick QC examples. Um, and then after that, we'll go through some of the examples of where things can go wrong. Okay, so let's just recall what we're doing when we're um, observing signals on a seismometer is we have a ground motion that goes into our seismometer. Our seismometer takes that ground motion and applies an equivalent voltage that it's putting out, and we record that voltage on a digitizer. Our digitizer takes that voltage and it tags the times, and we get something out that are time-tagged counts. We send those to IRIS. When IRIS has them, they package this all up as mini-seed data, and then you make your web service request so that you get this data. And what you get out is you get ground motion and counts convolved with instrument response, which is not what you want. You want ground motion. And so you're stuck dealing with this stuff. And so it's relatively straightforward, but it does require a little bit of care to, to make sure you don't mess up these steps of going back to actual ground motion as opposed to 
getting stuck with ground motion in counts. So very briefly, um, I would like to describe the response, which is something we need to deal with. And so um, what we've talked about is that our seismometer outputs a voltage and it's proportional to ground motion. Well, it's only proportional to ground motion across a certain frequency band, and this is called the pass band. Um, and so this is where your sensor outputs a voltage proportional to ground motion. However, as the signals start getting uh, lower and lower frequency, your seismometer actually attenuates out those signals, so you need to correct their attenuation. And at high frequencies, the same thing happens. So this middle section would be where the sensor is proportional to ground motion, and then it would attenuate out signals um, at low frequencies and also at high frequencies. And on this right side, which I'm not going to get into, um, this is the actual response file that's describing all this information of how your instrument's working um, in terms of what it's outputting proportional to. So if we go back to our example um, of the Trillium Compact and the epicenter from an aftershock study, I've plotted up the responses. So blue is the velocity response of the sensor. So this sensor is proportional to velocity um, across this band. And then as we get to lower frequency signals, it starts attenuating out. The signal and then if we look at orange so our accelerometer it's proportional to acceleration so if we plot it on a velocity plot it looks like it decays at one over f um, and so these are the two responses so when we get our data from iris we have these two contributions plus we have different units and so before i continue on with that example i want to briefly explain on a global scale this gets even more complicated because you have most networks have multiple different response, multiple different instruments, and each instrument will have its own response curve. And then say for the GSN, every station's instrument will have its own response curve from calibrations. So you end up in a situation where you do need to be a little careful that you can't just apply some sort of mid-band gain correction. You need to remove all these responses, which isn't a big to-do, but it is something to keep in mind if depending on what your application is okay so going back to our example of the trillium compact which i've shown in blue and the epicenter in orange this is the time series from those spectra we showed so this is what you get from iris and if you look at the uh, peak to peak counts you'll see that the trillium compact has around a hundred thousand counts and the accelerometer is around minus 25,000 counts. Um, and then there's some, so there's some offset in those two. So this is not ground motion. It's something proportional to it that we want to correct for if we want these two recordings to have the same um, amplitude. So first thing we can do is we can scale them. So this would be where we remove what we call the sensitivity. Um, however, we still get two things that are different. So we get our blue is our velocity sensor, so we have something in millimeters per second, whereas the epicenter has units of millimeters per second squared, so you would see these would be out of phase if you zoomed in on them, um, and they still have the offset. Once we've removed the response, we now have common units. Um, both of them are now in millimeters per second squared. However, you can see that they don't overlay perfectly, and this is because the epicenter is um, recorded at 200 samples per second, whereas the Trillium Compact is recorded at 100 samples per second. So the epicenter still has additional content in it that we aren't able to get out of the velocity sensor because we're not recording at that high of a sample rate. However, when we filter to a common pass band, we get two traces that overlay very closely from two different instruments. One's recording proportional to acceleration and the other one's pr recording proportional to velocity. So I want to briefly say that when you're doing this exercise of removing the response, sometimes things go wrong, um, and sometimes it can be because your metadata is bad. And then also, in which case, you might want to contact the network operator. Um, sometimes you're also looking at data that you don't think you might be looking at, in which case there's a great tool from IRIS, which is the metadata aggregator, which is a quick way of doing a sanity check of do I 
am, is what I'm looking at, what I think it is. Okay, so now that we've discussed some basic seismic data processing or some quick QC, I want to give some examples of where things can go wrong or where we're recording things other than seismic signals um, and show how these can sort of get inserted into the data. So the first thing to consider is most modern seismometers actually record in a Galperin mode. So this is a UVW mode. Um, and each module is actually dis sort of 45 degrees off of vertical. And so the modules record a mix of horizontal and vertical signals. And then these get summed and differenced to output traditional vertical data and two horizontal components. So if the summing somehow goes bad, you can end up in a situation below where you have data in UVW mode that has similar noise levels on all three, um, which shouldn't happen because we should always have vertical data on good broadband sensors that's better, that's lower noise than the horizontals because we're not sensitive to tilt. So this is a, a good quick sanity check is if you have three component data on a broadband sensor and all three components have very similar noise levels, there might be something a little off. Um, whereas if you see something where your vertical data is quite a bit lower um, noise, that's always a good sign. Okay, so the next example is magnetic field variation. So we, we know that our sensors are made of all sorts of um, magnetic materials and when we install them at high latitudes, we actually end up recording the Earth's magnetic field on them very closely. So here's a TA Alaska station at Poker um, is the blue trace. And then uh, this is the vertical component data. And then we have a magnetometer installed nearby. Um, this is the three components of that. Um, and so you can see that the actual, the seismic data at Poker is following very closely the magnetic field. So this is something you don't want on a seismometer. We want to record seismic signals, not magnetic fields. Um, but since our sensors are sensitive to this, we can end up in situations where we're dominated by the magnetic field. And then orange is where you, there's a way of actually correcting this out. And so you can correct out some of the magnetic field signals on the data. So if we look at this across TA Alaska during a magnetic storm, um, so this was in February 28th, uh, February 28th of 2019. So each of these dots represents the vertical signal out of the seismometer. And on the bottom, I have the magnetic field. Um, and then this little black line shows where we are in this magnetic field recording. And then the color indicates how much amplitude is seen, being, being seen by that sensor. And so we see right when the magnetic field starts to vary a lot. We start seeing a lot of variation in the sensors, and this is roughly one of a magnetic um, field line. So you can see that these sensors are very good magnetometers, which is something we don't want. Okay, um, so we've given examples of, of some pressure and how those introduce tilt noise. We've also shown some magnetic field uh, variations. Here's sort of a different example um, where it's the same thing, where we're seeing um, seismic noise that's not from, not seismically induced, but coming from something else. So what I have, we've taken, we have three instruments at Tucson. So this is the GSN station Tuc. This is the vault they're in. And you can see that while it's on the side of the hill, it's still going to be see fairly large thermal variations. Um, we have three sensors at the station, an STS-2 in a foam box, an STS-6 and an STS-1, so three broadband sensors. And if we look at their semi-diurnal earth tides, we see that the 12-hour tide, all three sensors overlay very closely um, on this. However, when we go to 24-hour periods, so similar to what we're going to get in terms of thermal effects, we start seeing that the all three sensors differ. So if we wanted to look at the earth tides at this station, we end up in a problem because we're getting earth tide plus thermally induced signal on different sensors. And going back to these sort of operating range diagrams, we're way at the very end of the Peterson low noise model, which is the two black lines. 
And if we look at these, this is semi-diurnal signal, and then we can see sort of this background noise level, and then right here we can see how these three don't agree on the diurnal um, at the diurnal period. So this is another example of where we're seeing non-seismically uh, induced noise. So I've given a few examples. However, um, there's sort of a, the big elephant in the room, which I, I won't discuss, which is how, how does pressure come in to different um, to seismic data via different phenomena? And this is actually, it ends up being very complicated because it's very frequency dependent. And then there's different situations depending on how things cancel or, or add um, that I'm not going to discuss. Um, but if, if you're interested, which I encourage you, there's a paper by Zern and Vlaunt that discusses all, all these different phenomenon and how they can add and cancel for vertical data. Okay, so we've shown some examples of where different, um, where our seismometers are recording different things that we don't want them to record. So for some of you, you're going to say, okay, does this really pertain to me? And so I want to give a quick example of where you might run into an, a situation um, that you wouldn't think of for seismic data because you're becoming limited because data is not passing your QC criteria. So what I've drawn, what I have here is I have ray path coverage for magnitude six and a half and larger events for um, Rayleigh waves. And then I'm, we're throwing out all data that doesn't meet a certain criterion in terms of amplitude. So we're saying we want to say we want to do a Q, uh, an inversion for Q on a global scale. Um, we have relatively good ray path coverage for 25 seconds. But then as we get to longer periods, we're getting less and less ray path coverage. And for example, we have very few stations in Africa um, that are capable of doing good 250 second amplitude estimates for our time period using the GSN. So we end up getting this sort of situation where we're limited in our ray path coverage at longer periods because of these different non-seismic noise sources are showing up and reducing the da usable data. So moving, taking this one step further, we can then take these uncertainties and we can invert for a Q model. Um, so these would be, this is, we're now wondering, okay, what is the uncertainty in Q coming from lack of ray path coverage and coming from the uncertainty in my amplitude estimates? And so that's what's shown in this middle. So um, purple indicates less uncertainty, whereas yellow starts to indicate more uncertainty. And well, in shorter periods, we have relatively little uncertainty coming from this issue of ray path coverage and amplitude errors. But as we go to longer periods, we start seeing these yellow streaks, which are actually coming from our lack of ray path coverage and elevated uncertainties and amplitudes. So this is an example of where your tomographic model could start to become limited because, because of um, lack of ray path coverage. And so you might say, okay, well, so what does this mean? Well, what it means is, is that some of the structure, potentially at 300 and 400 kilometers depth, we're not able to resolve because the 300, 300 and 400 kilometer structure is largely sensitive to um, long period surface waves. So these are sensitivity kernels from the bulk modulus, and you can see that at around 400 kilometers, both, most of our sensitivity from Rayleigh waves comes from 150 second period or 250 second period Rayleigh waves. So this is an example, again, of where we become limited in our data because of noise, and then it shows up, it can show up as introducing uncertainty in our model. So now I want to take the last few minutes um, to briefly review what we've been doing. So, um, so very briefly, we started with looking at seismometers from um, 132 AD. So the little dragons would drop the balls into the frogs, and that, would, that was a three-bit system. And then 2,000 years later, we've gone to these modern instruments. So what I'm showing here is a T360, and these have... 26 bits or more of dynamic range. And it's pretty incredible that we're able to record all these different signals. So we're able to see things from 50 Hertz out to earth tide frequencies. Um, 
And then I want to point out that we've kind of shown that generally we're not instrument limited, but we're environmentally limited. So it's not that we need better instruments, it's we need better ways to install them and better ways to isolate them from non-seismic noise sources. Okay, we've shown some of the pitfalls that we can happen when we're um, looking at data. So remember that we don't get out ground motion when we make a web request from Iris. Instead, we get out ground motion convolved with some things and that we need to be a little careful when we remove them. Um, and then the other thing that I've hopefully conveyed is that seismometers record more than just earthquakes, so be careful. So here's an example of a spectrogram from Rob Anthony where the horizontal axis is the day of, uh, of August and then the vertical axis is frequency and what we're looking at is the, um, the Hurricane Harvey from I think it was two years ago uh, in the swell off the coast on a TALF or TA station. So this is TA station 735B. Um, and what we see is we see a few earthquakes in here. We have our diurnal cultural noise, and then this, um, the swell of Hurricane Harvey. And then when Hurricane Harvey hits shore, we see a whole bunch of wind noise coming in on the instrument. So this is another example of where we generally want to be recording just earthquakes, but we're recording all sorts of other signals, and some of them may be a little counterintuitive at first um, glance. Um, I want to make a sm quick small plug for um, a lot of the people behind the scenes. So uh, a lot of this, a lot of uh, the open sourceness of seismic data has made it so that we can get um, a lot of data at our fingertips very easily. Um, and we have a lot of great tools currently to re request this data and also easily process it. And so um, when you're publishing your papers, I'd encourage you to give credit to the, the folks that are behind the scenes. So for example, a lot of the infrastructure for programming and also the network operators um, whose data you're using, um, I'd encourage you to cite their DOIs if you're making use of that data. And the, the DOIs for the different networks can all be found at the Federated um, Data, I don't remember the acronym, but the FDSN, you can um, get all the different DOIs for the data you use. And I'd encourage you to put those in your papers to point out that you appreciate the data coming from these network operators. So, um, I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, and I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, I hope you stay healthy, and uh, thanks for listening. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute myself there. Thank you so much, Adam. That was awesome. Now I'm going to read off some of these great questions. Uh, folks, if you have questions for Dr. Ringler, write them in the questions section. Okay, so we're going to start with, uh, could you please explain what tilt is and how it affects the signal? Thank you. So tilt is where we have the we have the instrument, and remember we have the mass that's stationary, and we have the frame around the mass. And so the tilt is when two of the feet of the frame are moving differentially to one another. So they're creating something that looks like a physical tilt on the instrument. And then that shows up as a horizontal signal on the instrument. Um, but it's not in fact a horizontal motion. Precise, good answer, thank you. So the next question, uh, how is velocity in millimeters per second squared? I think that would be an acceleration. So I maybe, maybe someone's pointing out I had a mistake on a slide. No, velocity should be in millimeters per second and acceleration should be in millimeters per second squared. All right, that somebody's got a good eye there. Okay, watch out. This one's coming from Carl Tate. Are you ready? Give you a second uh, to prepare yourself. <laughs> Who decides the importance of each band pass in terms of developing seismometers and improving installation methods? Is it the people buying seismometers? Governments trying to monitor nuclear test uh, treaties, the number of scientific papers being published. What are your thoughts? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, 
so for example, the, the GSN was designed as a multi-use network, and so they wanted as wide a band as possible for as many applications. While before the WWSSN was a monitoring network where they wanted to detect um, nuclear explosions, and so um, I think most people tend to be going towards um, multi-use networks to try to accommodate as many people as possible. Um, and so I, I think that we really want to encourage as, as many different people to speak their opinion on you know, what kind of instrumentation they can get. So no, we won't be able to install STS-1 level instruments you know, for, for large and anytime soon, but I, I do think people want to consider different um, applications that might not be their, their direct uh, point of interest. Don't know that that answered the question, but I, yes. That's a hard question, yeah. Okay, so uh, could you show a tree noise example? For as much as I've heard about trees as a problem, I don't think I've ever seen an example. That's a very good question, and there is a paper, the paper I cited for the salmon experiment, so I believe it was Kyle, Kyle, Kyle and Carl Tate, they have some examples of tree noise. And I, I have not seen very many other examples of that, but it's, it's relatively high frequency. Yes, thank you, that, that's a useful reference. All right, machine learning techniques have found a firm footing in energy seismic sector. How prevalent are these techniques used in noise filtering? So there's been a couple of recent papers, and I'm not an expert on this, so I'm not the, a good person to answer. There have been some recent papers showing a lot of promise um, in using machine learning for filtering out um, a lot of the unwanted noise. Um, however, there, there's also been a few studies that have shown that you can also get situations where you could potentially bias your machine learning because you're getting common signals that are unwanted signals. So for example, wind events could, if, if you're not careful, could end up um, causing some problems in machine learning. However, yeah, I apologize. That's, that's a little bit out of my realm of expertise. That's all right. That was a good answer. Okay, this one is uh, going to be difficult to be brief. Uh, can you describe briefly the future path of development in seismic sensors? Um, so, I mean, what I've hopefully conveyed a little bit of about is that in a lot of ways, we're capable of recording most of the signals on the instruments. The big thing moving forward, I think, is going to be um, learning how to better mitigate these unwanted signals and learn how to install sort of large scale numbers of sensors um, easily. So, for example, we still don't have a lot of seismic data coming out of Africa. Um, so, sensors that don't require a lot of infrastructure and are still capable of recording very low noise um, data are kind of something that I, I think is hopefully moving forward. And then the other thing is, is um, we still don't have many seismometers on ocean bottoms. Um, and again, that's going, that's limiting ray path coverage. Um, and I, I think those are two avenues that hopefully is where seismic instrumentation goes. Yeah, good, okay. Uh, next question, is there a way to make corrections in earthworm modules for the problems you described, like for magnetic field noise? Uh, for magnetic field noise, I'm, I'm not familiar with earthworm, but for magnetic field noise, if you have local um, magnetometer, you can correct that out. Um, you can also correct out, if you have uh, barometric pressure, you can correct out portions of uh, barometric pressure. So there are ways of removing some of these signals. Um, Making these corrections easier or more routine, I think, is something that will be important in the future as we're relying on um, more and more data that could have examples of these sorts of unwanted signals in them. Right, right. 
All right, Ken Anderson is weighing in on Carl's question. He says, this is the reason IRIS exists, where community input on standards and specifications of instruments can be developed. So just a little bit of um, additional information on that question from Carl. Uh, do you have any comments or info about developments in rotational seismometers? Um, yes, there, there's there's a lot of work being done in rotational sensors, um, and I, I think it's it's very promising. Um, there, my opinion is is it currently things um, like the the ring laser in Germany. So if people aren't familiar, there's a, a very large uh, vertical rotational sensor in Germany. Um, they can produce very high quality uh, rotational data. The problem is, is we only there's only one of those. So I think you know from progress moving forward in rotational seismology is really the question of can we start getting lots of uh, data from different sites and um, deploying things, and so there's something called an IX Blue, which is a very promising rotational sensor. So if, say, a pie in the sky idea is if every GSN site had a rotational sensor, you, you might get more than just the three components that we're currently recording. Okay, thank you. Um, why is less tilt a greater depth? Could you repeat that question you cut out? Oh, sorry, why is there less tilt at greater depths? There, there's less tilt at greater depths because pressure doesn't, pressure effects on the surface are what are causing these tilts. So you can think of the crust as sort of this big membrane as, and as wind and pressure changes, the sensors at the top of this, that are sitting on the top of the crust are seeing these changes as tilts because of the de deformation but as we go as we go down um, to lower to greater depths we're seeing less and less of this pressure induced noise because we're attenuating out that signal hmm. that makes sense uh, the deeper a sensor is installed the better but what do you recommend for cases where burial isn't possible um I think is any way you can try to isolate a sensor. So this is not the most practical way, but one thing we've done is we sometimes have installed sensors with water bricks. And if you're unfamiliar what a water brick is, is it's basically a big brick with water in it. Um, and it actually increases the thermal capacity around the sensor, making it so that it doesn't see as large a variability from temperature changes. So any ways you can help further isolate the sensor from changes in temperature or pressure um, are good things. So another example is you can install your sensor with, we put little fleece hats on them and foam boxes around them. Um, and that's again, to try to isolate it from um, temperature variations. Okay, next question. Can we filter the unwanted noise using its polarization? For example, separation of Rayleigh and love waves. That is a very good question. Um, so we currently don't understand what portion of what portion of the noise is coming from Rayleigh or love waves. And um, this question, it should actually, I thought it should be possible to do this, but um, it ends up being sort of counterintuitive or hard. And it might be because um, we're seeing a lot of different source regions from our, our noise or our noise isn't polarized exactly how we think it is. But um, so I wanna say yes, because I, I think that should work and that's a great idea. I just, I've never seen it fully work and I don't know why. I love it. I love it when, when we're not quite sure. That just means there's more to learn. Why is the horizontal signal more sensitive than the vertical signal? The horizontal is more sensitive because it sees tilt as um, sine theta, whereas the vertical sensor sees it as cosine theta. And so if you sort of think back to your um, Taylor expansions, you, you've tilt on the vertical component is theta squared. So a small tilt is even smaller, whereas it's directly, for small angles, it's directly proportional to the angle on horizontals. Okay, I've been waiting for this next question, uh, knowing someone was going to ask. 
Uh, would you like to comment about the reduction in background noise due to the COVID-19 quarantines? Um, yeah, so there's, there's been, there's a whole bunch of people on Twitter and it's been very interesting to watch. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's sort of been sort of, it, it, it was sort of, it's been well known for a long time that as we decrease sort of cultural activity, we decrease noise. So people have known that on the weekends it's quieter um, at high frequencies because there's less people going into work. Um, however, I, th I think this is pretty unprecedented that we've never seen uh, it happening sort of this widespread and this globally before. Yes, here we all are sitting in our home offices. Uh, is it possible to correct an instrument data for the tilt effect? If so, are there active, uh, is there active research on instrument calibration for tilt errors? Uh, so, so the LIGO experiment has shown some promise in correcting out tilt signals. And I believe um, some folks in Germany have also um, been able to do this in certain situations. And for OBSs, I think it's possible. Uh, one of the problems you run into for low noise sites is to correct, correct this out, you need a rotational sensor that's better than your seismometer. And so that becomes very difficult to do. So you're, you're wanting to correct out sort of small tilts um, and you need an instrument that's already better than a seismometer and seismometers are pretty good. So yes, there's situations where you can correct this out, but it's generally in high, very high noise environments. Okay. Uh, what is the frequency range for the small foreshocks before large earthquakes? Mostly they come from slow slips before large earthquakes. How can we detect them? That's a very good question, and I am not the person to answer that. So uh, I, I apologize, but I'm gonna, I don't know. Stay tuned maybe for a future IRIS webinar. Uh, is there a standard method for removing tilt effects using co-located GPS tilt data? If so, how does a deeply varied seismometer compare to a shallow corrected one in terms of noise and cost effectiveness? Um, that's a hard question. Um, so I, I think the uncertainty in GPS data is not, it's, it's too large to use for corrections uh, at, on seismic signals. Um, and then, um, yes, installing sensors at say 188 meters depth is, is very expensive um, because you're having to drill a hole that's a borehole that's not that easy and you also need all the equipment to get these things down there so um, they're very expensive to do uh, however you know as a, as I showed of that spec uh, the spectra from that magnitude 8.2 event there's a lot of useful information that we might not be recording because we're limited on horizontal uh, instruments so I, I kind of split around the cost effectiveness part of that question and I apologize. That was, a, that was a really good question, quite difficult. Um, lots of questions about tilt meters. This one may have been asked, but just in case they have slightly different take, if we co-located the tilt meter with a borehole, could we deconvolve the real tilt signal from the horizontal motion using that independent data? And are you aware of any studies that have done this? Um, yeah, so again, I, I think this goes back to LIGO and um, some folks in Germany have done this and then they've done it in OBSs, but it's all again very high noise environments um so so sort of typical ta stations i don't know that it's been successfully done um at the noise levels of a typical ta station for example right uh casey adderhold which is an iris seismologist has written in to to just comment that uh, we also see widespread noise reduction on common holidays so that's another time that we see the cultural noise reduction um kind of around the world also next one can you explain why some sensors measure in velocity and some measure in acceleration um yes so th this the sensors are they're all basically a mass on a with a frame around them um, um what i didn't discuss is 
where this is controlled and where these get their huge dynamic range is actually in the electronics of the instrument. And so it's a feedback loop that tries to keep the mass stationary. And this feedback loop, we can actually put integrators or differentiators in there to sort of control the signal um, that comes out of them. And then instrument manufacturers do this to sort of play with where the instrument will be most sensitive and to suppress noise, for example, in the mechanics of, this, uh, of the instrument. So basically they can control it in the electronics. Okay, someone is asking uh, for the list of paper references that appear in the presentation. So um, I'll, I'll talk to Adam afterwards and see if we can get that and we would put that as a list on the YouTube channel. So just a comment uh, for that person. The next question is, do you know how to calculate the dynamic range of mechanical seismometers from the early 1900s? Um, so I've, I've done this for some WWSSN data um, and basically um, we know that the we know that the largest signal it'd be able to record is basically the width of the paper so you could take your piece of smoke paper and figure out how, how big of a how big can the um, signal deflect and then you can also um, digitize your data by taking a picture of it and then there's um, some software from the Harvard group for digitizing seismographs and you can look at what's the smallest signal and from that you can uh, estimate the um, the dynamic range of the instruments. Um, so yes, you can do it. I have not done it for some very, very early instruments. I've only done it for one in, for the 1960s, so it's relatively modern from relative to that question. But yes, it should be possible. All right, so uh, Mouse would like to point out that I'm rapid firing questions at you and that this is like a comps exam for your PhD and you're doing a great job. I think you're gonna get your, your PhD here again. <laughs> Thank so, you, Mouse. Um, there was another question, here it is. How accurate is the data in the attenuated part of the frequency band after instrument response correction? So the GSN design goal is 1%. Um, so we should be able to record signals in the absence of these non-seismic signals to within about 0.2% um, if they're carefully calibrated, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, however, the, the big issue right now is, is it's more of a logistics problem of how do you carefully individually calibrate every single sensor um, and so my recent estimate is I believe that I, I from Rayleigh Wave estimates, I think the GSN is um, calibrated to within about 3%. So at long period signals, you can assume they're good to within about 3% um, via comparing co-located sensors. All right. So this is a, a very specific question. This will be our last question. Um, I've been working with data recorded at 200 to 250 samples per second, mostly recorded on short period instruments. Is the 50 hertz limit just the normal Nyquist frequency for most people's networks or have I been confusing noise with data? And then they say, I study tiny, tiny local earthquakes and flash floods, so I do expect them to have relatively high frequency signal content, but... So that's a great question. Um, and I think a lot of people have been moving to higher and higher frequencies. And I used 50 Hertz as sort of a reference because that's sort of a rough highest frequency for uh, GSN data. Um, but no, as people move to higher and higher frequencies, um, that's a great question because it starts to come, get into the acoustic band where again, we'll, excuse me, likely be recording things other than seismic signals. And I actually, I don't think we, much past 10 Hertz, I don't think we understand a lot about the background noise um, on in the world other than when we all stay at home um, it gets quieter there's a lot of questions out there that are completely unanswered in that range all right so I'd like to thank everyone for coming I would very much like to thank you Dr. Ringler for uh, passing your comps in the second round here uh, since Mouse pointed out that's what it seems like and thank you for a great presentation again this will be up on um, the IRIS YouTube channel uh, by the end of the day. 
everybody stay safe, wash your hands, stay home. Thank you again for coming. And we will talk to you again soon. Thank you, Adam. Hey, thank you.